Welcome to the day five of the physician's course uh, on heart failure management. I am joined here by the Heart Failure Association of India and the Heart Failure Association of India. Uh, today uh, we have uh, three talks and uh, uh, due to the unforeseen uh, circumstances due to COVID, we will not have a recap and we will also uh, not have the two case presentations at the end. So to moderate uh, today's session, we have uh, the eminent people, Dr. Raisati Murthy, Dr. Manohar, and Dr. Jason. Over to uh, the three of them. Thank you. The, the first topic is uh, by Dr. Bhagirath, which is a real hot topic of the day. Uh, the COVID heart failure, what is the contribution of the COVID, COVID cardio, and heart failure, how to manage them? Is it different from the conventional way of treating these, pa these patients? So let us hear to Dr. Bagirath. And at the end of uh, Dr. Bagirath's talk, we'll have a lively discussion. Dr. Bagirath, the ground, please. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everybody. I'll just share my screen. <clears throat> Maybe everybody else can mute. Yeah, yeah, sure. Slides are visible, sir? Absolutely fine, sir. Good oh. evening, everybody. Uh, as uh, Dr. Satyamurthy rightly mentioned, this is the hot topic of the day. Heart failure and COVID-19. What are the principles of management? This is absolutely the need of the hour. And we need to look at the various ways in which we can tackle this problem. The prevalence of heart failure in COVID-19 patients is 4 to 23%, and this would be an understatement. In fact, it's much, much more. Risk of complications are higher in patients with heart failure because, as we all know, most of these patients are older and have many multiple comorbidities. COVID-19 can cause or precipitate myocardial injury and worsen heart failure, and we all now know that it is due to the cytokine storm that happens in COVID-19 patients that literally tears apart the myocardial tissue. This is also called as the hyperinflammation syndrome. Those with substantially high troponin values, BNP, NT-pro BNP values, that is the natriuretic peptide values, or even those who need high dose of loop diuretics are the patients who are at high risk. And these are the patients that need to be immediately taken up for more aggressive management or else there could be serious morbidity or mortality. So the first important question is, is it heart failure or is it COVID-19 or is it both of them? How to make out based on the symptom presentation of a patient? So if you look at the Zhang et al. publication in European Heart Journal 2020, he beautifully summarizes the signs and symptoms and compares it in heart failure versus COVID. So if you look at the patient profile, exertional dyspnea, fatigue, bilateral rails in both lungs or leg cramps will be there in both of these clinical scenarios. However, patients have diarrhea or gastrointestinal symptoms more common and more often in COVID-19. Also, rails with change with cough are more common in the COVID-19 group. Dry cough is there in COVID-19, but is usually rare in heart failure. It is usually the wet cough that is there. Further, muscle pain is not there in heart failure, but is very common in COVID-19. In fact, this even persists after recovery of the patient. The third heart sound raised JVP, hepatojugular reflux, bilateral lower limb edema are all common in the heart failure variety, whereas COVID-19 does not have these symptoms. Of course, you will have a mix and match of all these symptoms if you have both the conditions coexisting. How does COVID affect the heart leading to heart failure? Now, this is a very interesting perception and a lot of work is currently being done to look into this. So let's get into this journey. The various mechanisms are increased oxygen demand, myocarditis, stress cardiomyopathy, there can be ischemia or infarction, 
as i already mentioned cytokine release syndrome elevated pa pressures are seen in these patients and of course venous thromboembolism you can have either all of these some of these or a mixture of these to produce the various clinical scenario now this is some fantastic work that has been done and published in cardiovascular research 2020 so this is the cardiomyocyte and this is the sars covid virus you can see that there are cardiospheres and then when you take a biopsy you actually see the covid virus seen there so if you see the panel on the right the arrow points to the presence of the coronavirus seen in the cardiomyocyte this is again more work with electron microscopy done so you can see that the sars cov2 virus affects the cardiosphere and you can actually see the image how it looks further some interesting ground breaking research ac ac2 inhibition and remdesivir so an interesting thing is the ace receptor now the ace receptor is present in all parts of our body so what happens is the ace receptor can the coronavirus uses the various spikes like what they call as a key which can be placed inside the lock of the ace receptor and that's how it gets into the body now if you use ace inhibition or if you use remdesivir these are the drugs that are going to block that ac receptor and prevent the virus entry so those who are on ace inhibitors have probably a less uh, severe course of infection as compared to those who don't and this is an interesting finding that has been found in patients with covid virus also the sars covid entry receptor ac2 is upregulated in a diseased heart as you can see a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so these patients have a greater chance of getting infected this is a beautiful slide the panel on the left shows the cardiac muscle with lymphocytic infiltration depending on the severity of the covid virus you can see that there is extensive lymphocytic infiltration in the panel on the left notwithstanding the panel on the right shows how covid virus can cause damage to the myocardial small vessels you can see from lymphocytic infiltration to even thrombus formation as seen by the arrows so this shows that the disease is extensive widespread and hence most of those patients who have severe heart failure is because of extensive virus infiltration not only in the muscle but also in the blood vessels and that's how unless it is properly treated these patients invariably end up with lots of morbidity and mortality now this is the clinical spectrum it can cause rv strain in 19% focal pericarditis 19% endocardial thrombosis 14% diffuse macrophage infiltration 86% small vessel thrombi you can see the thrombus there 19% lymphocytic myocarditis 14% so this is the spectrum by which covid affects the heart now all of these eventually lead to the pathway of heart failure lv dysfunction acute coronary syndrome myocardial edema as seen in myocarditis atrial fibrillation or vt these are the arrhythmic way in which a patient can get acute heart failure systemic coagulopathy and right heart failure thromboembolism and then eventually acute right heart failure acute heart failure so these are the various spectra of presentation now let's look at how to investigate such a patient if you look at the various investigations that are relevant the routine blood tests of course have to be done but what stands out is in the wbc count there is lymphopenia and decreased lymphocytes to wbc ratio ecg can show some changes like st depression t inversion or the occasional q waves echo wall motion abnormality you can also see reduced global lv function ct scan is particular for covid infection predominantly central and basal lung congestion we also have a corat score basal pleural effusions and cardiac enlargement a hallmark investigation is cardiac mri to pick up covid myocarditis there is extensive edema not only in the myocardial cell but also in the intervening interstitial tissue increased wall thickness diffused biventricular hypokinesis another important investigation is the biomarkers elevated troponin levels elevated bnp and anti pro bnp elevated d dimer levels 
and a host of others ranging from ferritin, fibrinogen, interleukin 6 and 10, and LDH. All of these can be seen in patients who have COVID with heart failure. Now, depending on whether COVID predominates or heart failure predominates, the profile of the patient in terms of investigation will vary. To give an example, the patient, the panel on the left, high chance of heart failure, low chance of COVID. So there's increased BNP, anti-pro BNP, there's a history of heart failure, congestion signs, ECG and X-ray are uh, showing such features, normal D-dimer and fibromyalgia. You also have the mid-pendulum, wherein it is uncertain about heart failure and COVID. So these have mild BNP or pro-BNP elevation, chest X-ray is doubtful, CRP is increased, mild BNP, pro-BNP increase, hypoxemia, increased D-dimer and fibrinogen. So this is a, where the pendulum is almost central. And again, the pendulum to the right is those who have lower chance of heart failure and higher chance of COVID based on investigations. These have less BNP and anti-pro-BNP levels. Relevant hypoxemia, tachypnea, respiratory acidosis is an important finding. More importantly, increased D-dimer and fibrinogen. So based on the presentation and profile of the patient, you know which way the pendulum swings. Again, coming to the investigations which are relevant for this patient, ECG, I've told you, causes, you can see 17% arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, VT, or even torsad can be seen in some patients. 41% have STT changes, 17% have QT prolongation. Biomarkers and cardiac enzymes, I would like to draw your attention to the BNP, anti-pro BNP, which are always increased. And if troponin is elevated, there is a 70% chance that you may lose the patient. So these are the patients that need to be earmarked for aggressive and more intensive management. Of course, the CK and LDH and D-dimer levels are increased in critically ill COVID patients. Let's look at the management. Incidence of acute heart failure in COVID is 13 to 33.3%. And these have these patients have very high BNP and anti-pro BNP levels. They are seen in patients who probably previously have heart failure, they have higher comorbidities, and they have severe COVID disease. Initiation of guideline-directed management is really important to save life. Invasive hemodynamic monitoring may be an option, as also the use of temporary mechanical circulatory support like the impeller, or if that is not available, at least an IABP may be helpful. If you look at the patient of COVID and heart failure concurrently being managed. So drugs for heart failure are the standard protocol, ACs, ARBs, ARMI, beta blockers, ibuprofene, MRAs, hydrolyzine with ISDN, SGLT2 inhibitors, and in some cases, device implantation. COVID drugs starting from hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, favipiravir, arbidol, interferon alpha, methylpred, lebeverin, ritonavir, and so on. So this is a combo of these medications. However, I must draw to your attention that there may be drug interaction between these two ways in which the patient is treated. And I have a chart that's coming up shortly, which will explain the same. General principles of management, avoid over aggressive fluid because you know that these patients' sats are always down. So fluid challenge is always a problem. Higher preload is desirable only in two situations if the patient has significant RV dysfunction or a high peak state. Effective CVP can be calculated by the measured CVP minus the peak. Target mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65, you have to start with norepinephrine infusion for hypotension. Consider dobutamine if there is worsening hypotension with cardiac dysfunction, and this is because these patients have to be salvaged. At the same time, chance of arrhythmic death is very high. Epinephrine and vasopressin are choices for refractory hypotension. Use angiotensin II for refractory vasoplegia. There are certain problems in management. What are they? Let's look at the troubleshooting chart. Respiratory management, venturi mask, non-invasive ventilation. Prone ventilation is a very, very useful option that has come up lately as also intubation, endotracheal intubation for patients who are sicker and unable to maintain sites. Hemodynamic man uh, with the management, you may need mechanical circulatory support, particularly the VV or VA ECMO. 
IABP and Impella. If not anything, IABP is definitely an option. Renal replacement therapy in the form of ultrafiltration or hemofiltration is important. Arrhythmias, AF, ventricular arrhythmias and tossart. Thromboembolism and bleeding, very interesting. The patient can either have clotting or bleeding. So you'll have to know the clinical scenario before medicating. They can have clots, pulmonary artery clots. They can have gastrointestinal bleeds. So whether you want to anticoagulate or you need to fix the gastrointestinal bleed is a choice that you have to make when you're salvaging the patient. Many patients have concomitant infection, sepsis, so they would need higher antibiotics. Coronary artery disease, again, revascularization, as already mentioned, they may have a type 1 clock or a type 2 clock. So these are problems that have to be dealt with. Many times we see that the patient has elevated troponin, but when you do an angiogram, you have, you have very insignificant disease. So this has to be tackled. Systemic hypertension, medicate accordingly. Myocardial injury and myocarditis, supportive medications, heart failure, LVAD, or even transplant in the long term. Most of these patients are depressed and anxious, so they would require psychiatric counseling and medications. LVAD patients, close monitoring of anticoagulation. You have to monitor the hemodynamics very carefully, invasive hemodynamic monitoring in selected cases. Transplant patients, drug interactions, temporary reduction in immunosuppression, and concomitant infection has to be tackled immediately. Standard medications, ACs, ARBs, ARNI, we have to monitor QT interval, particularly in the drug interaction category. Prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation and advanced care planning are an absolute must. Here are some treatment flow options and charts that have been published. This was discussed in the Heart Failure Association presentation. So they may, the, the heart failure and COVID patient, home treatment for patients who can be managed with telemedicine, hospitalization for the more symptomatic type, and end-of-life treatment, you need to pair up with a medical social worker and make sure that these patients are cared for till the very end. As soon as a patient with heart failure and COVID comes up in the triage, you need to not only assess the patient, but also the caregiver. Suspected patients and non-suspected COVID-19 patients are separated by a set of investigations and risk stratify them who needs to stay in hospital and who needs to go back home. Suspected COVID-19, Heart failure patients screen for COVID, look at the body temperature, SATs, ABG, and so on. So if it's positive, admit in the COVID unit, negative in the non-COVID area. If there's suspicion, repeat the test and then find out whether the patient is COVID positive or negative. Confirmed COVID cases, you have to hospitalize, assess fluid status, decompensated heart failure or stable heart failure, treat for COVID, support the oxygen, modify accordingly, prevent uh, the ARDS from happening and consider ECMO in such patients. Those receiving COVID drugs, look at BP management and heart rate management. Do they have hypertension or hypo and manage accordingly, whether it's fluids or medication. Also consider you may want to withdraw the ACE inhibitors, ARBs and RB. Heart rate management, Brady or tacky. look at whether you want to interrupt the IVA breading or reduce the dose of beta blocker oxygen is important and then manage with standard medications. There are some unanswered questions. Telemedicine, safety, efficacy, remote care, safety of the visiting nurse, phlebotomy, those who come home, capacity for remote monitoring, impact of patient quality of life, impact of family, caregiver, urgent diagnostics, alteration in the GDMT and so on. So all of these have to be looked into, especially in telemedicine. Procedural delays, there's likely to be delay in ICD, CRT, and VAD implantation, and this may even cost a life, so we need to be very careful. Safety of non-invasive post-transplant surveillance rejection may be impaired because of the COVID pandemic. Alternatives have to be also assessed, and impact of the transplantation wait list should also be looked into. This is the drug interaction that I spoke of. Favipiravir and Remdesivir are among the safest, safest whereas hydroxychloroquine, darunavir, OBC stat, and lopiravir and ritonavir have interactions with heart failure medications. Variables that affect recovery, LV diastolic dysfunction, often subclinical and reversible, LV systolic function, there is a higher need of mechanical ventilation, a right heart dysfunction associated, often associated with severe pH, I should draw your attention to troponin levels. The higher it is, the worse the outcome. Levels more than 28 nanogram per ml 
is associated with the non-survivor types. These are the patients who are likely to die. Anti-proBNP levels more than 900. Again, steep increase in mortality. ACE inhibitors and ARBs should always be on board and should not be discontinued. Along with when they are on board, less severe disease, lower cytokinase, and lower viral load. So some key messages before I wind up. Patients with heart failure are at increased risk of COVID and have poorer outcome. Telemonitoring is very important. All hospitalized patients should be screened for COVID. At the time of admission, heart failure patients with suspected or confirmed COVID must undergo standard investigations. Blood counts, biomarkers should be repeated as often as required. Echo is a must. Careful assessment of fluid status, invasive hemodynamic monitoring in selected group. If you can't do that, at least repeat IVC diameter and collapsibility by a bedside echo. Invasive hemodynamic monitoring should be instituted after the acute infection has subsided. Guideline directed medical management, invasive ventilation, mechanical support, and RRP as necessary, and judicious use of available resources. Additional recommendation taken from Hari's article. Heart transplant and COVID-19, I'll just take 30 seconds more. Heart transplant patients are not at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. So, but however, we should avoid donors with known or suspected COVID-19. Vaccination, a common question asked, should we continue with the regular vaccines or no? And the answer is a definite yes. The influenza and pneumococcal vaccine as per protocol. And long-term recommendations, avoid strenuous activities, avoid very vigorous aerobic exercise for three to six months after the COVID. A passing mention of COVID with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What's interesting is they have shared cardiometabolic risk factors and shared inflammatory pathogenesis. And that makes it very interesting. Patients with COVID-19 have hypoxemia, ARDS, systemic inflammatory response and hypercoagulable state. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, short and long-term risk of heart failure, especially in the HEPF variety. So there are three variants that are seen. Exacerbation of pre-existing HEPF, progression of subclinical HEPF, and development of new heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The compendium includes myocardial damage, RV dilatation and dysfunction, pH, and LV diastolic dysfunction. Concluding remarks. Patients with heart failure may be at increased risk of severe disease and complications from COVID. So we have to ma manage them and take, the, uh, take them very, very seriously. COVID-19 infection can cause a worsened heart failure through a variety of mechanisms. I've shown you the entire spectrum. So with so many mechanisms and the bad news is that all of them can be there concurrently, which makes treating them very, very difficult. Delivery of heart failure care has been significantly restructured during the COVID-19 pandemic and future studies should address the impact of pandemic delays on outcomes in patients with heart failure. Some key messages from Dr. Hari's article, COVID-19 infection causes development of myocardial injury and can lead to significant complications, cardio cardiovascular complications, including heart failure. Guideline directed <laughs> therapy is the most important Long-term cardiovascular events are yet to be ascertained. We don't have data for that. Most important, last line is protection of healthcare personnel from contracting the disease should be given high priority. This is my last slide showing fatigue, medical fatigue. Spare a thought. I think uh, Dr. Uday is one of them here in the panel. Absolutely exhausted. Thank you one and all for your attention. And now the topic is for discussion. To initiate the discussion, I would like to ask him one question. Is this COVID myocarditis different from usual influenza myocarditis or dengue myocarditis? Sir, at a cellular level, it's almost the same. Uh, if you see the MRI, uh, uh, the MRI picture, it, you see that there is inflammation of the cardiomyocyte, there is interstitial edema, there is uh, global hypokinesia. But only thing is that the outcome with treatment is variable. This is because multiple mechanisms are there and the disease is far more devastating than the other problem. That's why the response to treatment is always poorer than other disorders. Okay. Uh, when we do the CT scans, invariably these patients, when they come to emergency, they do a CT scan. Yes. And when it is not suggestive or when it's suggestive, then they call us for giving the cardiac support. Yes. Many times we can't make out pulmonary venous hypertension yes. 
with this covid uh, lung yes. uh, pathology so that particular thing is should be kept in mind yes so we need uh, multiple investigations i think one of course ct scan is highly sensitive and specific but again it's not the gold standard as far as uh, covid is concerned you need to have multiple investigations now ct scan has become more uh, relevant in the second wave because many patients are rt pcr negative but ct scan is showing evidence of covid because uh, the rt pcr is done in the nasopharynx whereas the second wave covid is directly into the lungs so that that, that way the, its importance has increased manifold for example a patient comes to emergency with covid and there is cardiac decompensation may not be it could be managed yes, and yes. at what level or after how many days we should take him as a planned procedure for a angio i'm not saying those patients who are collapsing or who has got acute myocardial infarction those patients who are stable or who get stabilized after admission after a gap of how many days we have to take them for is there any stipulated time because we have to protect ourselves as well as the cath lab staff from covid and we should make sure that patient won't get thromboembolic episodes or thrombosis stent thrombosis in case we do a intervention yeah. so anything stipulated like that so uh, i'd like to answer this question in a tangent that is there is first of all no guideline to this i think it is based on the individual as well as the institutional guidelines now on a different note there are both ways in which you could argue one is you might have to take the patient early institute mechanical circulatory support renal uh, renal replacement therapy as well as uh, ventilation because the timeline for the patient crashing is very very small and once the patient has collapsed and has an arrest the chance of salvage is very very poor so in such patients you might want to intervene immediately so whether covid positive or negative level 3 pp and we have to get on with the treatment for the more stable varieties probably you you could take an institutional call about waiting but again within that spectrum you can have acute decompensation so again because you are having two problems concurrently you are not dealing with heart failure alone you are dealing with heart failure with covid so covid becoming more active it can have the typical waxing and waning the cytokine storm is known so you can have exacerbations which will suddenly tilt the balance and make the patient worse so i think there's no room for complacency these patients have to be treated as high alert we've seen many many patients who been stabilized shifted to the ward sudden collapse and then found dead so that underlines the importance of taking these patients really seriously and we have to up the level of treatment well taken see uh, many of these patient develop pulmonary thrombosis yes it is not the embolism it is a small vessel thrombosis yes M many of them when recover there be patient needs oxygen uh, therapy even at home either oh. cpap or bipap whatever is indicated in them but many of them we don't see pulmonary hypertension i don't know what is the uh, opinion of other colleagues of mine and uh, we look for there will be lot of patches in both lower limbs but uh, lower lower uh, parts of the lung lower zones but when you we do the echo the pulmonary hypertension may be borderline rather than severe pulmonary hypertension yeah so uh, sir if i can begin the discussion uh, we've had uh, extensive uh, discussions with our pulmonology team mm. so those who have thrombosis and who've been given adequate anticoagulation and the clots are dissolved mm. uh, the chances and probability of developing severe ph is often less they only develop mild ph but those who had severe lung damage and replacement fibrosis this is the category that slowly progresses into more severe forms of pH. I invite comments from others in the panel. Sir, uh, we also observe the same thing, but uh, I don't know whether anticoagulation has any relation to be to these patients developing pH because most of these patients inevitably receive anticoagulation. So I'm just wondering with that changes the outcome in terms of uh, residual pH or not because Dr. Uh, Dr. Manohar, I would like to add to your question one more thing. I, do, uh, I don't treat COVID per se unless there are cardiac complications. They are not but, because uh, as frequently uh, in these people uh, 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 many in of ICUs. These, uh, so, uh, many of these people who are treating COVID, some of them put their patients on low molecular weight heparin. Some of them will put their patients on uh, uh, suboptimal dose of rivaroxaban. Some of them give epixaban 2.5 milligrams. 
twice a day, but there's no uniform dosage. Is there any particular recommended dosage? Is this extension to Dr. Manohar's question for clarification? I'm not uh, trying to question it. Okay, I want to know myself which is the most ideal way of treating these patients or preventing thromboembolic complications. Any of the people can contribute from the house. Dr. Jay Shankar, sir. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I don't think we have a guideline directed. I mean, preferred agent is a NOAC. And as uh, Dr. Satyamurthy, sir, rightly pointed out, uh, somebody gives rivaroxaban 10, somebody gives apixaban uh, 2.5 twice, and if they give dabigator and they give 110 twice, or I've even seen 110 once a day in our hospital. We've treated a lot of COVID now. I think it is the jurisdiction or the uh, individualized uh, therapy. Going back to Dr. Chatimurthy sir's uh, uh, statement that we don't see many pH in these patients, perhaps it is not the proximal PAs which are affected. So we don't have large chunk of thrombi, what we have seen. We definitely see distal uh, vasculature getting affected. And uh, perhaps we are not carefully looking into PAs because uh, as cardiologists, I do not know about my colleagues, I seldom do echo for uh, these patients myself, but it's in the technical staff. Uh, I'm being very honest here. Uh, but at follow-up, again, I must uh, confess that I don't see much pH uh, again. Uh, perhaps, as uh, rightly pointed out earlier, it is all because of anticoagulant which has been instituted very early in the course of the disease. Dr. Chopra Saba, Dr. Bagirat, what do you recommend uh, anticoagulants for these patients or anti-platelet drugs? So logically, I think if we have to anticoagulate, we should give a full dose of anticoagulation. I mean, I don't see any uh, logic in giving 2.5 milligram twice a day of aliquis. Why not 5 milligram twice a day? If we are preventing thrombo, uh, thrombosis in the vessels, we need to give a full dose. That's, that's the way that I would look at it. I agree with uh, Chopra, sir, that uh, uh, the way forward is uh, either we, uh, we give the Novax in full dose, uh, if at all we are using warfarin, then uh, obviously maintain a therapeutic uh, range. So the clarity on duration is not there. How long? No, no, no guidelines. For, they give for two weeks, from three usually, weeks. Usually they give for two weeks, two weeks, and uh, or they give low marvetipen for one week, and one more week at home when they get discharged. But there is no concrete uh, recommendation. No guideline to that effect. No guideline. Stephen, uh, any comments from you, Stephen? Say again. Stephen, any comments from you on this point? Uh, Anticoagulation, how long, what dose? Look, there are so many trials ongoing. I'm personally involved in them uh, with, uh, from in Germany, running a, the COVID prevent. Um, I, I believe there was recently a, a review article last week in Jack on, on this issue. Uh, I would, this is house rules by everybody. Uh, we personally uh, prefer uh, rivaroxaban. Sure. One more question. When they get discharged, they ask whether they need vaccination. How soon they require vaccination or how long we have to wait after they suffer COVID? Any recommendation? Because usually patients ask us this question. Yeah, but what's the point of that question if you have a priority list in the, in the country? Uh, uh, so unfortunately here, it is freely available. Government uh, supports them. So that priority list is not there. Of course, patients who are above 50, they are getting now. And from 1st May, I think our country is releasing for those above 32 years. So 18. the... Uh, 18. Above 18. Above 18. Above 18. 18. Above 18. Yeah. And as so, a corollary to this question, what right. if somebody got first dose of uh, vaccine hmm. and in the intervening period they developed... COVID infection. What is the strategy? Should you wait? Should you go with the normal protocol? Any uh, what, what I understood from the literature is that when once a person develops COVID, it is better than getting two shots of vaccination. For next six months, the immunity is built up. That is what, uh, because the T cell immunity is better in those people who suffer COVID uh, because even their IgG levels are very high when they do the uh, the blood testing. 
so uh, is what so i understand you, sir one uh, one uh, question regarding what you just raised we, hmm. if you check the igt levels hmm. it's different in different patients the immune response is different in different patients so would you for those who have a milder response would you still consider uh, you know giving them the uh, regular uh, protocol so again uh, no answer to this uh, no answer what to this i told views? i told this is what i understood from the literature but when they ask i say at least wait for 4 to 6 weeks after covid then take your second shot or if you are going to take the first shot give a gap of 4 to 6 weeks that is what i tell but there no st uh, stringent recommendation or guidelines i want to hear from you people what i should tell my patients if they ask that is the correct sir echoing what you just said our uh, pulmonology team has uh, come up with this uh, recommendation again 4 to 6 weeks and the rationale for that is the mutant uh, uh, that is their double mutant and now they say triple mutant so if you want some form of protection against uh, uh, reinfection and a different mutant virus then probably the way to go is uh, by a proper vaccination protocol there there is one more hitch also those people who are treated with steroids they are likely to have less immunity compared to those who never needed steroids that is means category b2 that is uh, debatable whether to give steroids or not so in the there is also one of the offshoots i i really can't understand much about it uh, naturally steroids will suppress the t cell immunity Uh, regarding uh, waiting after a covid infection i think there are icmr guidelines for this yes. and i think it is 6 weeks six and uh, because uh, i remember at the center where we go for the vaccination these guidelines are clearly printed and written i think it is 6 weeks but i need to confirm that oh, very good sir sure any more questions to dr bagirath please or clarifications there is a trial which is going to be presented at is a late breaker at acc that is dapagliflozin in patients with covid 19 infection so that will be interesting yes dr jayshankar we will go ahead with the next yeah. talk no i just wanted to check with bagirath this uh, ace inhibitor there was some concern and then one of your slides you said if need be you can lower the dose of ace inhibitor is only no, for no, hypotensive no. patients or no 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 ace inhibitor stays no modification in that my lower the dose is with as far as immunosuppression for transplant is concerned the general consensus is don't do it unless you have special situations where there is a need to do it otherwise no don't touch the ace inhibitors or the others let's go on to the next talk probably Dr. Jay Shankar, can you take over? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bagirath. It was wonderful uh, having uh, very nice, very nice talk. Listen to you. It was extensive, very nice. I personally stood uh, to gain a lot. I, I must say, I must confess. And uh, thank you again, Bagirath. I would now uh, invite Professor uh, Stephen Anker to uh, deliver his talk on SGLT2 inhibition in heart failure for heart failure in the COVID era. and of course professor chopra had just uh, commented that uh, the late breaking trial is going to be also discussed i think it will be good to hear from dr anker regarding this uh, over to you professor anker it's a recorded talk so maybe that can be played hello everybody great pleasure to be with you again in this heart failure association of india educational initiative and one of my really favorite topics uh, in this time and age is to better the treatment of heart failure patients with the use of sglt2 inhibitors you know there has been a lot of advance there and i would like to give you a little bit of a summary of what was done so far and an outlook what is coming very soon uh, when new studies will report of course this all started with the effort of uh, developing new Uh, glucose lowering new anti diabetic therapies and sglt2 inhibitors are just one of the classes of drugs uh, being developed besides glp1 agonists or dpp4 inhibitors sglt2 inhibitors have been developed over the last you might say 15 to 20 years and starting around about 2015 we saw positive results particularly with the emperic outcomes trial uh, in diabetes in general but now moving this to heart failure patients with and without diabetes we are entering in a new phase where i believe we will recognize in full that 
these drugs are not really only anti-diabetic glucose lowering drugs. These drugs are metabolic modifiers, metabolic efficientizers for the status of the patient. And they're good for kidney function. They're good for cardiovascular events. They're good for oval, overall metabolism. Emperor Reduced and DAPA HF have reported in heart failure. And this, uh, remember, we had at one time also physical meetings. This was at the ESC Congress 2019 in Paris. And the primary composite outcome of DAPA glyphosate versus placebo trial in heart failure, 26% reduction in events. And importantly, this was the same in patients with and without diabetes. 4,700 patient studies. This is important because this trial was bigger than the emperor reduced trial by quite a margin. Uh, and so you can see here the results, very impressive. The emperor reduced trial that we published in last year, and I had a great chance to be involved in this one. Uh, and uh, this is why I'm also having the luck with this great team to chair the emperor preserve trial, where we basically uh, report later this year. But here, Emperor Reduced is a trial that shows not only cardiovascular, but also renal outcomes to improve. The trial had a one-to-one -one randomization of empagliflozin versus placebo and looked for a primary composite outcome of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death, but then also looked into renal function and total heart failure events uh, in terms of hierarchical secondary outcomes. There's one or two special issues about the recruitment of these patients. And the first is that uh, the trial that included patients with reduced ejection fraction up to a 40% uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, it basically made the NTBNP values required higher the closer your ejection fraction came to 40%. The trial was in total uh, a little bit smaller, 3,700 patients, then DAPA HF with 4,700. So the idea was to get some more events by making these patients prone to have hospitalizations. And that's why some higher NTBMP values were used. There was a second thing that was different. The GFR was studied in these patients for inclusion and only patients with a GFR less than 20 were excluded. So when other trials, including DAPA-HF, used 30 as the cut point, here it is 20. And so this, of course, gives you a broader use, a broader piece of information about the patients. Inclusion and exclusion criteria resulted in 3,700 patients being recruited with these criteria here. Age 67, very similar to DAPA-HF. And also the percentage of women, the percentage of diabetic patients was very, very similar. 50% had diabetes in this study. And the average ejection fraction was 27. It was 31 in DAPA, so a little bit higher there. NTBMP naturally also higher here, 500 uh, picogram per milliliter on average, higher 1,900 instead of 1,400. And the GFR, when you go lower, you get patients with lower GFR included, 62 versus 66. And in terms of modern therapy, this trial was the best at the time, 20% with an ARNI at baseline in DAPA-HF, 10%. Now, you know already the primary results, and this is uh, not cutting the story very long. Uh, here, you basically see empagliflozin reduces by 25%, the combined endpoint, of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This is the primary endpoint, a number needed to treat of 19, an absolute risk reduction of 5.2%, so a very big benefit. The benefit is particularly strong for hospitalizations for heart failure, for cardiovascular mortality in this study, 8% reduction. Now, one interesting, very interesting feature, and we published recently on this, the benefits were seen very, very early. The first time that the trial was significantly different in terms of events uh, and statistics was after day 12. There was a very early benefit. After day 34, actually, the trial was significant until the end. So already after a little over one month, 
you have significant results and they remain significant throughout the study. So this is really showing us that there is a lot of very fast benefit. Now, in terms of subgroups, here you see the diabetic versus non-diabetic group uh, and very similar to DAPA-HF, a benefit is there regardless of how you call these patients and how their glucose metabolism is assessed. You also see other subgroups, very similar results. And for instance, when you then focus on the prior medication with mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or with ANIs, you can see it doesn't matter what other therapy you have, you always get a benefit from SGLT2 inhibition with empagliflozin. You get the benefit whether or not you have an MRA, whether or not you have an ARNI. So this is very good news. Now, I would kindly ask you to not give too much to the ejection fraction, BNP interaction. Don't forget, we have different criteria for patients with different ejection fractions for anti-BNP. In terms of the secondary endpoints, hierarchically speaking, uh, heart failure hospitalization first and recurrent is then the number one additional assessment. And you see here a 30% reduction, very powerful and lasting effect. Again, starting early and throughout the trial getting bigger and bigger, the difference. What about GFR slope differences? Well, first of all, during the whole trial, there was a difference that was highly significant with two milliliters uh, for the slope measured from week number four. But if you then, for instance, stop the therapy and reassess the patient 30 days later and then ask yourself, well, relative to baseline, uh, after an average of like one and a half years, how is the GFR change in these thousand patients where this assessment was possible? And there is a one milliliter GFR reduction in those who basically received empagliflozin, and there is a 4.2 milliliter reduction in those on placebo. So in that way of analyzing things, even taking into account the first four weeks from baseline to end of study, you have a three milliliter benefit, two milliliter per year. Now this actually has consequences. And this is the first trial, and this was emphasized already in the title of the New England paper, that renal heart outcomes are also improved. And as a 50% reduction in renal heart outcomes, this was significant in this trial alone. Of course, we don't know yet what is happening with the emperor preserved, but there will also be a pooled analysis study. Uh, and I will come back to this in a second. Now, improving events is one thing. What about quality of life? What about symptoms? Now, New York heart class, you all know, uh, it can go up, it can go down. And when you look at this, you see the basically here the treatment effect for the improvement by one neuroc heart class in those receiving EMPA versus placebo. And there was a 40% higher likelihood to be one class better already after four weeks. And equally, there was, if you think only about the deteriorations, uh, in the placebo group, there were 30% more people deteriorating so not only does it improve you, but it also protects you against deterioration uh, for neurocard class. And then the classical way of looking at the KCCQ clinical summary score, so quality of life assessment by questionnaire, uh, there was a highly significant reduction, 1.7 points. Uh, and uh, this was without imputation for this. This is the pure result of the quality of life studies. So what about biochemical changes? Uh, most notable, um, I mean, these are 50% non-diabetic patients. So there is essentially almost no difference in hemoglobin A1C. There is a quite a strong difference in the hematocrit, and this will be receiving several additional analysis. Erythropoietin is stimulated by uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. NTBNP, uh, if you look here at this 0.87, that means there was a 13% reduction in anti-BNP. Body weight, very little, 0.8 kilogram. Systolic blood pressure, one milliliter, very little. So this is really working by itself on kidney function, on cardiac events. Uh, it basically improves overall status of patients. 
But what about side effects then? Well, symptomatic hypotension, hypoglycemia, and ketoacidosis are no problem at all. They are equal or not even existent for ketoacidosis. The only thing where you have a slight increase is genital tract infections, uh, but it's much less than previously reported. So hygiene measures do make a difference. Only 1% absolute difference, and this is mostly mycotic kind of infections. We can discuss this if you want. Uh, short treatment interruptions, short treatments uh, of the general tract infection, and then restarting SGLT2 inhibitors should be no problem. A little bit uh, of additional data on the diabetic and non-diabetic patients, and just to prove the point, they are very different. The non-diabetics, you see none of them injuring or sulfonylurea or any uh, anti-diabetic medication with DPP-4 targeting or GLP-1. Um, these patients are very different, of course, for their treatment. So what about then the events? Are the pre-diabetic patients a little bit more like the diabetics or a little bit more like the truly non-glycemic disorder labeled kind of patients? So first of all, when you say diabetic and non-diabetic patients, these are the event rates uh, in the study. And if you look here for the pre-diabetic in the middle, and on the right, the no glycemic disorder patient, you can see they're very similar. So the pre-diabetic patients are not like diabetics. They are really like non-diabetic patients. So this classification is very interesting. It helps us basically saying for the future, studies that basically distinguish between diabetics and non-diabetics, they are valid doing this and calling the pre-diabetic patients uh, non-diabetic patients. You look here at the results with the kaplan meier curves, no significant interaction at all. You have a benefit uh, in both subgroups. And here you see basically the uh, plots uh, looking at the uh, interaction in a continuous fashion, assuming linearity or using splines. And you can see basically the benefit is mostly very clearly there, regardless of the hemoglobin A1C level of the patient included in the study. Now, there are, of course, differences between the trial, not only in the inclusion and in the size, but a little bit also in the results. And most notably, people said, what about cardiovascular death? And this is the reason why we did a meta-analysis published in the Lancet last year, uh, and this is basically showing that there is no heterogeneity at all, p-values 0.4 between the results, but overall the results are significant. There is a reduction in cardiovascular mortality with SGLT2 inhibition using DAPA, using empagliflozin of 14%. The results for cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, they are essentially spot on the same 26% reduction. And also look here at the subgroups with and without diabetes, very, very similar results. So this is a helpful therapy for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction with and without diabetes. Now, this brings me basically towards the end of this and discussing what else is there to come. And the big additional thing besides some studies, of course, in CKD, besides studies looking in the future also in myocardial infarct patient, the big thing is to come is the patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure. We have the Emperor Preserved study coming this year, and we have the DELIVER trial coming very likely next year. So there will be more information. The interesting thing is in Emperor Preserved, we have the same set of primary and secondary endpoints and the same hierarchical rules. So you may remember that in DAPA HF, there were like six hierarchical endpoints, here only three. Why so few have some asked? Well, what hasn't received much attention is that the alpha that is still preserved because all these three endpoints were positive, uh -huh. the alpha moves to the emperor pooled analysis of both trials together. So now we have a pooled analysis with alpha protection, so with statistical validity. The question is whether this alpha will become a little bit bigger. 
Uh, and for that, emperor preserved also would need to be positive. It is designed in the same way as Ember Reduced, with the exception that we are now talking 6,000 patients and we have an average two and a half years of follow up. And the closeout is happening as we speak. Uh, and we will have the results ready for presentation and publication end of August at the time of the ESC meeting. So the Emperor Pooled analysis is then very exciting as well because it uses heart kidney outcomes as the primary endpoint. It's the first time we ever have a protected, statistically valid assessment in heart failure patients for kidney heart outcomes. And then of course, cardiovascular and all cause mortality are the uh, hierarchical secondary outcomes in these assessments. We shall wow. see, there are many, many events, well above 850 events. Uh, and so we shall see how this turns out. So let me summarize. Where is the place of SGLT2 inhibition in heart failure? Well, the place is in every patient. And Solo is suggests we can even do this in patients recently admitted or just discharged uh, for a hospitalization for heart failure. There's more trials with DAPA and empagliflozin that will come out to confirm this. Certainly when the uh, ambulatory setting is re-established, DAPA-HF and EMPA reduced show this already for patients with ejection fraction uh, less or equal to 40%. So we can use this in every patient. We should use it in every patient. Look here at the electrolyte imbalances. There's a number of medicines we use in heart failure that have these kind of problems, but in SGLT2 inhibitors, we don't have that no hyper or hypokalemia, uh, no other problems of anything to speak about. And then what about once daily dosing, use of a single dose overall or titration? Well, no titration, use of a single dose, uh, once daily dosing. It couldn't be more simple to use an SGLT2 inhibitor. So uh, I kindly ask that you consider using them in as many as you can patients. We are not doing good enough in general. Here you see basically different medicines and recent analysis of the CHAMP-HF registry, ACE inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, beta blockers, MRAs. And what you see here in blue is the percentage of patients that have no contraindication and still don't receive the therapy. We need basically uh, these patients to receive this medicine we should do it, we should follow the guideline. Now, this is the old guideline. Uh, and there is basically, of course, no mentioning yet of SGLT2 inhibitors. They should be mentioned as maybe many other things. You know that the ESC guidelines, the ACC, AHA guidelines come out later this year. I think they will all recognize SGLT2 inhibitors with evidence base, particularly empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, and possibly to some degree sotagliflozin, they will need to recognize them as one of the foundational therapies. I believe there is now four really good evidence-based medicines, RASI and ARNI, beta blockers, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitors in HFREF. And with that, I would like to say thank you, and let's discuss this issue and make sure every patient receives it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anchor, uh, to set the ball rolling. Uh, may I ask one question, uh, if permitted? Uh, do your patients on SGLT2 inhibitors, you must have seen quite a few coming up with COVID. COVID and heart failure, did they have any lesser uh, effect on uh, the heart failure when was they are on SGLT2 inhibitor? Did it, I mean, those who are on pre existent SGLT2 inhibitor, did you? Was your observation that they had lesser forms of heart failure? I'm That's sorry, I don't, I don't get the question. What effect is there in heart failure what, compared to what? Acoustically, I didn't get the question. No, it's just that those who are already on SGLT2 inhibitors, did they have a lesser severity of heart failure while they had COVID? There were. There was nobody in our trials already on SGLT2 inhibitors. In, in our studies, 
people were randomized to uh, empagliflozin or placebo, but nobody was previously on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And <clears throat> so this is, uh, I don't think, um, a problem. Uh, and now with regards to COVID, uh, the EMPOR reduced trial uh, reported in 2020 in August, but the patients were finished following in February. So it was not affected by COVID. And with regards to the Emperor Preserve trial, I will only know the results and be able to speak about it after the results are presented uh, end of August. Dr. Jashanka, you'll get some sense when the DARE 19 is presented. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, one uh, very, uh, uh, you know, a question, but a practical doubt I have. If patient is not affording RNA therapy, and uh, can we, you know, initiate these people on SGLT2 inhibitors even before initiating RNA therapy? If you want to choose between the two, can we choose this as the first choice in heart failure patients? Absolutely, yes. Thank you for asking this question. That's why we have these subgroup analysis uh, for uh, the meta-analysis for EMPRO reduced specifically in heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction. Of course, Anani is a very, very good therapy, but if uh, it's not possible for, for instance, as you say, economic reasons, uh, then from the results we have, we can be very sure that the effect uh, is equally good in patients who are already on an ANI, but also in those who are not already on an ANI. In Emperor Reduced, uh, we had 80% not on an ANI, and they got all the benefit, but the 20% who were already on the ANI also got the benefit. So either way is possible. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there are three questions on the chat box. I'm just putting them up for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Satyamati, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. After, after one and a half month, after a patient recovers from COVID, he can go for COVID. What is, where is the question, ma'am? So that is a comment. I think the second one, how to use SGLT2 okay, 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 in a patient okay. with concurrent heart failure and urinary tract infection. But well, if the urinary tract infection is ongoing, uh, I would uh, suggest that please this is first uh, cleared uh, before you start SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, it's, it's not something uh, to start at the same time when a urinary tract infection is ongoing. So this was a requirement that patients are free uh, at baseline of urinary tract infection, but also it's simply um, good medical practice uh, to do it this way uh, in the future. So if you remind me of the other question there in the, in the yeah. chat box. There are still two inhibitors can be used in a yes. diabetic patient yes. with concurrent heart failure and cerebral vascular. Yeah, it's almost like two indications instead of only one. Uh, remember, the Emberreg Outcomes trial recruited patients with ongoing cardiovascular illness, uh, but heart failure was not amongst those illnesses allowing inclusion in Emberreg Outcomes. And you got benefit, very strong benefit, maybe amongst all the trials, the best benefit uh, with empagliflozin. Uh, but in heart failure, we now also see that uh, dapagliflozin empagliflozin, and if it's available somewhere, also sotagliflozin uh, work in heart failure patients. And so uh, a patient with heart failure and vascular disease, yes, I see this as even like two indications if that patient also has diabetes. Dr. Anker. Let me ask you one question about the sotagliflozin trials. Mm -hmm. Since the trials were interrupted, although the results were pointing exactly in the same direction as dapagliflozin and empagliflozin trials, mm -hmm. does that impact their approval? That's one. And second, the other thing which was seen with sotagliflozin was a reduction in strokes mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, cor right. atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Mm 
-hmm. Is that do you be, believe that is SGLT one effect or is it something else? Well, uh, thank you for both these questions. Uh, now let's start with the, the last one. You you used the correct word belief. Um, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows exactly whether the SGLT uh, one inhibition effect uh, is making all this difference. Uh, if we see uh, this in several trials, um, maybe there is something about it. And of course, we would like additional mechanistic research to, to find out. Uh, it's something to keep in mind, uh, but this will be a big question for future development work. Now, let's also not forget this was a trial program restricted to patients with type 2 diabetes. It was liberal on the heart failure side uh, because it also included patients with higher injection fractions, half MRF, half PEF, uh, and it also started the therapy in quite a number of patients much earlier, including in the hospital. So in that sense, it was more liberal, but in another sense, it was less liberal because it really only used them in type 2 diabetic patients. How this all then will pan out in a regulatory approval process, uh, I don't know. Sotagliflozin is already approved for type 1 diabetes, interestingly. Uh, I personally think there's a good chance it will be approved for type 2 diabetes, um, certainly diabetes in general with the SCORE trial, 6,000 patients, you have a good uh, database, but even with the heart failure trials, but then of course, with the heart failure trials, focusing on type two diabetes patients only, uh, you might say that the results are so consistent uh, and, and very positive uh, that uh, you might consider approval, but neither you nor I are in the driving seat for making that decision. We can just voice an opinion. So if sotagliflozin is approved for type 1, why not the other SGLT2 inhibitors? I know there are studies ongoing. They are also trying to get a type 1 diabetes approval. Uh, it's a question of uh, doing, of completing the studies, I guess. Uh, for sure, I know this with empagliflozin, there are such trials ongoing. Thank you. Uh, this uh, topic has been very well covered. Let us move on to the next topic. May I request Dr. Manoharan uh, to take care of the sharing? And Dr. Ajay Behel will be talking on the valvular heart disease. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stephen, sir. Thank you, Satyamukh, sir, for this opportunity. I, Without wasting much time, I would invite Dr. Ajay Behel to talk about valvular heart disease in this, uh, uh, and uh, it's always a pleasure to hear. Over to him. Sir, please take over. Good evening. Uh, today, I will be speaking on valvular heart disease uh, and heart failure in the context of heart failure. So, uh, as far as uh, many of patients with valvular heart disease have got heart failure reduced ejection fraction. That means a patient with mitral or aortic regurgitation, the LVF goes down, it goes down to 20, 30, 40 percent. In that case, it is important to start the standard heart failure therapy of beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARB, ARNEs, and the SGLT2 inhibitors. The exception to this is aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis where we have to be careful in avoiding hypertension in these disorders. Of course, in mitral stenosis, beta blockers relieve the symptoms of heart failure and they reduce the transvalvular gradient. In addition, it is important to advise influenza and the pneumococcal vaccinations. So uh, another topic which is often very, uh, or very often not discussed in heart failure uh, uh, symposia is infective endocarditis prophylaxis. And this is very relevant to patients with valvular heart disease. So infective endocarditis, as per, uh, as per the American Heart Association guidelines, is currently recommended only for dental procedures that involve manipulations of the gingiva, periapical region of the teeth, or perforation of the oral mucosa. These are not normally recommended for non-dental procedures like transesophageal echoes, uh, endoscopies, colonoscopies, cystoscopies in the absence of active infection. 
Of course, the risk of bacteremia is very low in these procedures in the absence of infection. However, in case uh, uh, these patients have infection, in that case, one can consider uh, infective endocarditis prophylaxis. So what are the situations in which infective endocarditis prophylaxis must be given? These include patients who have prosthetic heart valves, including TAVI, that is transcatheter-induced valves, prosthetic material used for valve repair, such as annuloplasty rings, previous history of endocarditis, unrepaired cyanotic disease, or repaired cyanotic heart disease with residual shunts or regurgitation, and cardiac transplant patients who have a valvular regurgitation, which is attribu attributable to a valvular abnormality. We must remember that the risk of endocarditis in transplant patients is highest in the first six months because of endothelial disruption, immunosuppressive therapy, and central venous access and endomyocardial biopsies. So now I will go down to the, these are very general uh, recommendations. Now I will go down to the specific conditions and I will be discussing only two conditions, mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation in the setting of heart failure. So I will only be discussing secondary mitral regurgitation. And we know that uh, these secondary regurgitations, whether it is mitral or tricuspid, are due to either annular dilatation or they are due to the distortion of the subvalvular apparatus. So let us first go to mitral regurgitation. So mitral regurgitation can complicate both heart failure reduced ejection fraction as well as preserved ejection fraction. But we must remember that the pathophysiology of mitral regurgitation in both these conditions is very different. As far as reduced ejection fraction is concerned, the mitral regurgitation is secondary to a ventricular abnormality. In preserved ejection fraction, the heart failure is predominantly due to a atrial abnormality. So let us first go to heart failure reduced ejection fraction in this, the mitral regurgitation is due to left ventricular remodeling, increasing the tethering force, LV dysfunction, which is reducing the closing force, as well as in patients with ischemic or non-ischemic myocardial diseases, there may be specific uh, segmental abnormal wall motion abnormalities. In heart failure preserved ejection fraction, there is left atrial dilatation due to diastolic dysfunction as well as increased left atrial pressure and atrial fibrillation. And this left atrial dilatation is what gives rise to mitral regurgitation. So uh, what about ventricular secondary mitral regurgitation? As we can see in this film, there is, uh, in this echo, we can see that there is left ventricular dilatation with spherical remodeling. There's displacement of the papillary muscle towards the apex, and there is tethering of the mitral valve reflex resulting in uh, their restricting their descent towards the closure plane. This we can very clearly see in this echo. We can also see that the cooptation point is displaced towards the apex and the mitral annulus is also dilated. So all these abnormalities is what gives rise to mitral regurgitation. So uh, in a ventricular secondary mitral regurgitation, that is patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, we must remember one thing that the regurgitant orifice is parallel with the cooptation line. It is semi-lunar in shape and it is best, the largest uh, uh, regurgitant orifice that you will get is in the two chamber view and you'll get smaller dimension in all other views. Therefore, the vena contracta is larger in the two chamber view as compared to all other views. And in these patients, it is very important to measure the vena contracta in the two chamber view. PISA is, assumes a, a circular regurgitant orifice for mitral regurgitation, uh, and therefore it is invalid and not very accurate in patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, where there is a ventricular secondary mitral regurgitation. And of course, three-dimensional echo is a very accurate uh, measure of uh, calculating the uh, orifice area or the regurgitant orifice area. As we can see in this uh, photograph, what we can very clearly see in these eco images is that when we see the two chamber view, we see that the effect, uh, uh, we can see that the vena contractor is large. Whereas when we look at the four chamber view, as well as when we look at the three chamber view, what we find is that the vena contractor is much smaller. So it's very important to look at the vena contractor in the two chamber view. And we can see that in this eco image, this is the four chamber view, 
and what you get is a small vena contractor and the same patient in the two chamber view and you can see that there is a huge vena contractor so always measure uh, the vena contractor in the two chamber view now ventricular secondary mr responds well to medical treatment in fact mitral regurgitation is reduced in 38% patients at 4 years based on just medical treatment absence of intraventricular conduction defect especially left bundle branch block was the best predictor of response of mitral regurgitation to medical management uh, the mitral regurgitation also worsens as a result of systolic dyssynchrony due to left bundle branch block and in these patients patients with left bundle branch block the mitral regurgitation very often improves with a crt in crt the reduction of mitral regurgitation occurs early within 3 to 6 months and the decrease in mr occurs in around 50 half the patients so uh, we know that mitral regurgitation is not a good prognostic indicator there seems to be a threshold a stage of no return when secondary mitral uh, mitral regurgitation stops responding to heart failure treatment and then there is progressive worsening of heart failure and once this threshold is crossed then these patients require repeat hospitalization and this becomes a signal for valve specific management that is going in for valve repair this is something controversial and the timing still remains a little controversial as as to when the valve repair should be carried out now the atrial secondary so we have discussed heart failure reduced ejection fraction whereas those with preserved ejection fraction very often have a atrial secondary mr this atrial secondary mr can respond to diuretics and in case these patients have atrial fibrillation then it can respond to rhythm control cardioversion or ablation now the we there are few specific hemodynamics as far as secondary mitral regurgitation is concerned typically the regurgitation is less in secondary mitral regurgitation than in primary mitral regurgitation that is due to a valvular heart disease the left ventricular and the left atrial dilatation are out of proportion to the degree of mitral regurgitation this is due to the underlying ventricular disease and the left atrial pressure is often elevated in these patients despite a lower regurgitant volume now stress echo is a very important modality in demonstrating mitral regurgitation and uh, in patients with non ischemic cardiomyopathy when the ventricular contractility improves with dobutamine we very often see that the mitral regurgitation can reduce reduction of mitral regurgitation is a good indicator good indicator of response to medical therapy and indicates a good prognosis severity of mitral regurgitation can increase on stress echo particularly in case that there is ischemia and there is systolic uh, dysfunction as well as in patients who have a dyssynchrony now stress echo can also induce dynamic mitral regurgitation in patients who have got a preserved ejection fraction and this is related to the increase in the left ventricular filling pressures as well as exertional symptoms so very often we see patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction they are fairly symptomatic we are not sure as to how the symptoms have developed and a stress echo in these patients if you demonstrate an mr then very often we can get an idea as to what is the that the mitral regurgitation is the cause of exertional symptoms in these patients so we we have a couple of trials of uh, interventional trials using mitra clip and the, uh, both these trials were published a few years back in the new england journal of medicine so first was the mitra fr trial this was a smaller trial in, included around 300 patients with severe secondary mr and in this trial was a negative trial that means death from any cause or even the primary endpoints were not significantly different in patients who underwent mitra clip as compared to controls the coop trial was a larger trial with around 600 patients with a mean ejection fraction of around 30% and this trial was the opposite of the mitra fr trial in that what was seen was that there were lower rates of heart failure hospitalization and there was a reduction in death which was seen at the follow up now the number treated 
to prevent one hospitalization was only 3.1 at two years in the co-op trial. So co-op was a positive trial, whereas my trial FR was a negative trial. So, but why, why the difference? Both the trials targeted the same patient population, the same disease, but the results were diametrically opposite. MITRA FR was neutral, whereas COP was highly positive with regard to the efficacy of the MITRA clip. Why this difference? So the difference is that patients with MITRA clip had more left ventricular damage. They had larger ventricles, whereas COP excluded patients with very severe ventricular dilatation. That means dimensions of they had an inclusion criteria in which patients with 70 millimeters and above left ventricular and, and diastolic dimensions were excluded. The inclusion criteria for the left ventricular ejection fraction also was lower in the MITRA FR trial. In MITRA FR, patients selected had a less severe MR, and these are the possible reasons why benefit was seen in the co-op trial, whereas no benefit was seen in the MITRA FR trial. The co-op also had a more aggressive strategy for correction of MR in that they used a larger number of clips and the co-op trial also had a better optimization of medical therapy. So by excluding patients with extreme left ventricular dilatation, probably we can get better results with the MITRA clip procedure. So in addition, heart failure patients with ischemic MR, severe left ventricular dimension, severe left ventricular dysfunction with a larger end systolic dimension of more than 55 millimeters are associated with high rates of persistent or recurrent MR, left, less reverse left, left ventricular remodeling and worse outcomes after correction of surgical, uh, surgical correction of ischemic MR. So this was data that was already available to us. And the, this is what was seen in the co-op as well as the MITRA FFR trial, that the patients with the most extreme left ventricular dilatation did not benefit from the MITRA clip therapy. So next, we go on to the tricuspid valve quickly. It's a forgotten valve with a very high surgical mortality in case they require re repair. And often, these patients do not receive effective therapy for tricuspid valve disease. So tricuspid regurgitation, we know, is functional in more than 90 per, uh, 90% and it is a hypertensive TR secondary to some left-sided heart disease. So uh, we know that it's a vicious cycle where once tricuspid regurgitation develops, it feeds more TR and the TR progressively increases and it has to be seen as a ventricular problem rather than a valve problem. So we just like in mitral valve, Tricuspid regurgitation can also be due to uh, atrial issue, as in patients with large right atrium with long-standing atrial fibrillation, and it can also be due to a ventricular, uh, a hypertensive TR, uh, as in a ventricular disease. So, in a hypertensive TR, the dilatation is mainly in the anterolateral dilate, uh, direction, whereas in patients who have an atrial TR or uh, due to an atrial dilatation the annular dilatation is preferentially along the posterior border. So we will not discuss primary tricuspid regurgitation, but it's important to say that very often patients with long-standing TR develop cirrhosis of liver, and they very often have liver function tests, and this is what contributes to some extent to the poor quality of life. In addition, they also have renal dysfunction commonly, and uh, the tricuspid regurgitation can be managed as, it can be considered into primary TR, this we would not like to discuss today. And what we are going to do is isolated late functional TR. And this is the area that we'll concentrate on today. So due to paucity of time, the primary TR, I will just skip. So patients who are undergoing a left heart surgery should have their tricuspid regurgitation corrected. It's usually done by a tricuspid valve annuloplasty. Severe tricuspid regurgitation does not improve after left-sided valvular heart disease, if it is left alone and is likely to worsen if it is left, treated, uh, left untreated, less than severe TR, the surgical practice is very heterogeneous, partially owing to lack of solid evidence, but if the annulus is dilated more than 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters per meter square of body surface area, or there is history of right heart failure, then the tricuspid valve should be repaired. So 
and we can see that these patients very often have a poor prognosis. This is a patient who's undergone a mitral valve re uh, replacement, but that he has left with a severe TR and has a very, uh, and ultimately he died of right-sided right heart failure. So isolated TR is associated with a very high mortality of up to around 25%. In particular, standalone late secondary TR after previous left-sided heart surgery is a difficult clinical situation because there is a high surgical mortality. And if these patients are left alone, again, the outcome is not very poor. So who are the patients who should be operated? They are symptomatic patients with severe functional tricuspid regurgitation in the absence of severe right ventricular dysfunction or severe pulmonary hypertension. So if severe pulmonary hypertension or severe right ventricular dysfunction is present, then the operative mortality is likely to be high. Today, we also have percutaneous interventions, which include several, including a, tri a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. And these can be considered in high-risk patients. To summarize, it's important to optimize heart failure management in patients with valvular heart disease, if their left ventricular ejection fraction is low, but one has to be specifically careful in patients with aortic stenosis. Secondary mitral and tricuspid regurgitation may be either ventricular or atrial, and they have different pathophysiologies. Mitra clip is today an option, but it should not be carried out in patients with extreme left ventricular dilatation. Severe tricuspid regurgitation impairs quality of life, and these patients Often the, uh, they complain of fatigue, tiredness, poor appetite, which is out of proportion to the heart failure. And tricuspid valve surgery in symptomatic patients can should be considered in the absence of severe pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular dysfunction. Thank you. One point is that uh, he covered very nicely, mm -hmm. but in the tricuspid valve, you mentioned that uh, you can have transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. That is possible if there is already a pre existing annular ring. Otherwise, there is nothing to hold the valve. So, that is one of the limitations of transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. That's true. Second thing, caval uh, valves. Uh, will make the uh, life difficult in future. If you want to do any intervention, you can't enter the heart. So these are the two limitations we should think of. Another thing is, uh, when patient has got rheumatic mitral valve disease or double valve disease with severe pulmonary hypertension, tricuspid regurgitation, usually we find after surgery, the, tri the tricuspid regurgitation will come down. Particularly, even on the table, they find pulmonary hypertension will come down. So, how to differentiate which patient may need tricuspid repair on the table or the tricuspid regurgitation will come down after surgery? Is there any way you can find out? I think there is. Uh, I, actually, if you are doing a balloon mitral valvotomy, these guidelines don't really apply. But these guidelines apply to patients who are undergoing surgery. Uh, because uh, 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 I think there is evidence to show that any patient with a severe tricuspid regurgitation should undergo a tricuspid valve repair. In case of moderate tricuspid valve, probably they should, especially if there is a uh, dilatation of the tricuspid annulus, which is defined as a tricuspid annulus of more than 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters per meter square of surface area. And if there's evidence of RV systolic dysfunction, again, that would be an uh, indicator for repairing a uh, moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So, I mean, uh, if, if, I mean, definitely on a table, we see that the BMV, the PA pressure drops and the tricuspid valve, uh, the tricuspid regurgitation re uh, reduces. Mm -hmm. But we cannot have the same assumption when a patient is going for surgery because uh, if if a patient is left with a tricuspid regurgitation, usually these patients ultimately will develop right heart failure after a few years. And then after that, the management becomes difficult. 
this uh, mitral clip uh, is uh, used as on off label in uh, tricuspid nerve repair also right? more than 1000 cases have been done and there is a tri dominant study which is going on for a similar device uh, by abbott uh, to do a h2x h2x i think it will be a simple thing to do from the right heart so once it comes up it will be a very useful addition to a probably the new valve mitral valve because uh, tricuspid has got three leaflets so very difficult to placate them or do a clip there like uh, on the left side yeah correct yeah. and it has been used off label there are some reports from 1000 cases on uh, off label use uh, in tricuspid valve The uh, the point is very well covered, Dr. Manohar. You want to make any comments, or shall I ask one more question? See, when you are talking about valvular heart disease, I thought uh, you will cover aortic stenosis with uh, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis because that is one of the commonest uh, things we can find in day to day practice. <clears throat> so, patients with uh, severe aortic stenosis, low flow, low gradient. So, that is one of the aspects of. Heart failure with valvular yes. heart. Yes, that, that is true. Actually, there was enough time to cover only two uh, possible conditions. So I covered something with secondary. Definitely, low flow aortic stenosis is a uh, important condition, and basically taking a decision uh, in these patients uh, becomes important. Maybe you can give a brief guideline as to you know the points or how do you take a decision for. Uh, Aortic low flow. So yes. uh, let us suppose a patient has got uh, aortic stenosis and we are not getting a gradient or uh, uh, we are getting a gradient which is just around mild or moderate gradient. In that case, uh, one option, the uh, what we need to do is that we can do a dobutamine stress echo and uh, we can see that one is that if the gradient significantly increases, uh, and the orifice uh, and the valve area remains less than, let us say, 0.8 centimeters square. That, that means the patient definitely has a, a severe aortic stenosis. The second uh, the situation can be that the contractility improved, but the gradient does not increase and the valve area increases. In, this, in these patients, it's a primary myocardial disease and the valve area, uh, uh, the aortic stenosis is not significant. The problem patients are in which the contractility does not increase. And these are the patients in which the decision becomes uh, uh, difficult to take. Can I... Uh, I use the CT score also. They use the CT score of the... Dr. Dr. Chopra, sir? Yes, sir. Can I just cover for him? Can I speak yes, for him? Please do. We all are waiting to learn. Yeah. <laughs> See, basically, low flow, low gradient out stenosis can be dichotomized, bifurcated in two types. Those associated with associated coronary artery disease, those without coronary artery disease. So for diagnosing this coronary artery disease, best treatment, uh, best uh, investigation is invasive angio. Why? Because if the calcific aortic valve is there, if you do a CT angio, one might miss the osteal left main disease. So better is the uh, invasive coronary angio. If invasive coronary angio rules out the coronary artery disease, we go to another subset of patients that is true aortic stenosis with normal coronaries. If there is associated coronary artery disease, these patients, if you do dobutamine stress echo, they can develop arrhythmias or they can develop angina and they can have false positive, uh, false negative uh, dobutamine stress because with the development of ischemia, when there is angina, coronary artery disease, you can develop false negative. So, dobutamine stress echo is not indicated when you find the associated coronary artery disease. When there is no coronary artery disease, then you can do dobutamine stress echo. If there is, like Dr. Bahel has already covered, if there is the aortic valve area is fixed, that means it is a true aortic stenosis, it is severe LV dysfunction. If the uh, uh, the uh, contractile, if there is a contractile result, that means 20% improvement in the stroke volume. That means those are the patients where there is preserved contractile result. They do very well with surgery. 
if there is no contractual reserve those are the patients where you have to have a dialogue with the people family that it may improve may not improve because most of the patients will have myocardial fibrosis the next group is the, those patients where aortic valve area is improved improves after dobutamine that is pseudo aortic stenosis those are the patients who have got severe lv dysfunction with calcific or aortic sclerosis or mild aortic stenosis the voice has gone doctor satya maybe you can switch off your video it may come uh, sir there's a comment from dr shastri if somebody could read it out we'll just put it up group totally has to be on really satya switch off your video we can't uh, switch it off okay okay Can you hear me now, Vijay? Yes, Vijay? Now yes. Huh? yes. Now it's clear. Your voice is clear. Now, what is the question, please? No, sir. It's just a comment, sir. Dr. Chopra, if somebody could just read it out. Yeah. So the comment is even subtly diseased tricuspid valve and annular dilatation more than four centimeters are indication for tricuspid valve repair when other valves are being operated. What do you think, Dr. Bell? i think it should be carried out because uh, these patients ultimately if they develop severe tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure they do very badly in the long run the only decision that uh, uh, we need to consider is that will doing a additional tricuspid valve procedure will it increase the mortality of the procedure let us suppose you're doing just a mitral valve along with that if you do a tricuspid valve it increases the surgery time and does it actually increase the mortality so that increase in mortality is not very significant so uh, these patients who have a trac uh, annular dilatation probably should go in for a trac or they should go in for a tricuspid valve repair yeah if these uh, patients need a, a replacement i think we should go only for a, a, a bioprosthetic valve because mechanical valves uh we always have a, a problem of uh, uh, valve thrombosis we actually had... actually many patients uh, sir good surgeons would like to do a plication and do a divaga repair it works very well and if they put a ring uh, then it is better in future if there is progression of a tr one can put a uh, uh, transcatheter valve I want to make one more uh, additional point, Dr. Chopra Sir, if you permit me. Yes, sir. Uh, one aspect of low flow, low gradient, I missed out is that there is a uh, thing called low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with preserved LV function. This is a article, very good article by Hichachi et al. What they say is a hypertrophied LV. If you find ejection fraction is 50 or 55, for that hypertrophic LV, that ejection fraction is very poor. so one must take longitudinal uh, shortening that is if more than minus 18 that means there is uh, severe lv dysfunction so these are the patients who may show less gradient but usually the well uh, the uh, what is it called you know, flow will be low that is less than 30 ml per square uh, square meter body surface area so that particular aspect that is why many patients in the olden days when we used to subject them for avr they used to develop severe lv dysfunction and heart failure from 80s we used to see during dr stanley john and all that you used to operate in vellore when we were there some of the patient never used to make it though ejection fraction those days no ejection fraction used to be by uh, what is that called uh, either levophase angio or enter the lv and do an angio so though it is a angiographic lv lv ejection fraction is good they is to worsen so the new concept which has come is low flow low gradient uh, low flow gradient uh, aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction yes sir uh, any other comments or questions any other questions in the chat box uh, uh, sir no sir no sir that's it one second sir dr shastri has put in another comment yeah 
in patients yeah. with paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with good LV function, one should rule out cardiac amyloidosis. Yeah, by by the time low flow occurs in uh, amyloid, usually echo uh, will detect. Yeah, in fact, this cardiac amyloidosis, uh, this TTR type of amyloidosis has been increasingly reported in the Western literature in patients with aortic stenosis. So we yes. are, uh, we have carried out a study over here. We are in the process. So we, uh, we have seen screen around 20 patients so far of uh, severe aortic stenosis, more than 65 years of age, using a calcium pyrophosphate scan. So we have not found even one out of the 20 having a cardiac amyloidosis, but it's this TTR amyloidosis is well reported in patients with aortic stenosis. Well taken. Point is well taken, but usually the echocardiographers will suspect there is a speckling of the interventricular septum. So by the time low flow, low gradient occurs, one doesn't miss out uh, by echo. Usually that gives a suspicion. But these people in Western literature reporting something like 16% of patients undergoing TAVI or Surgical only ECM. one report, sir. Only one report. One report. Uh, actually, actually, the gold, gold standard is a calcium pyrophosphate scan, or it's a very sensitive test for a TTR amyloidosis. So yes. we but have carried out in around 20 so far. We haven't got it. Isn't just an in, fact, in fact, it is more specific than uh, cardiac MRI. More specific than cardiac MRI. I taken, well taken. Point is well taken. Excellently covered all topics. Where is Dr. Manohar disappeared? Huh? Dr. Jay Shankar? Dr. Jay Shankar Manohar? Okay, I think you can confirm. Yeah. yeah. All topics are very well covered. We, in fact, I learned a lot. Yes, I know very little about COVID heart failure, and I'm really happy that I participated in this symposium. I thank my uh, colleagues, Dr. Jay Shankar and Dr. Manohar. And all the speakers who have done excellently well. Thank you, Dr. V.A. for getting us on this podium. Thank you very much. Any concluding remarks, Dr. Vijay? No, Hari, over to you. Yeah, I think we had a very good session. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, next uh, session will be on next Wednesday. That will be the last session. We will have a recap at the post-test. Uh, so we are ready for the post-test. Good night. See you all next time. Okay. Thank, thank you, Harry. Thank you. Good night. Good night.